Welcome to Ultralight Startups, the first ever future energy event. Woo! Thank you for coming out. Round of applause. So, my name is Graham Lawler. I am the founder of Ultralight Startups, um, and I will be your co host tonight along with Chris DeLuca. So, I founded Ultralight Startups uh, four years ago uh, here in New York. I run the New York chapter. Chris runs the Boston chapter. Um, just for a, a quick introduction, we've been around for four years. We've done this format of event uh, for internet startup companies. So typically, what you would see here is internet companies, web-based uh, startups, uh, mobile-based startups, social media companies, that sort of thing, presenting to a panel of internet startup investors. Um, this is the first time we've ever done an event uh, of this format with energy-related content. So this is a bit new for us, and there's a bit of uh, some, some changes to the, to the format. We're going to be using PowerPoint slides rather than demoing websites. Uh, our panel is obviously uh, energy and clean tech VCs rather than internet startup VCs. So um, it's an experiment. We'll see how it goes. This is the format. Um, we're going to do some introductions. Uh, we're going to see eight startup pitches. We'll do four, and then we'll take a short break, and then we'll do another four. Uh, and then we'll do a, a pitch contest. So all of you guys are going to be deciding on your favorite startups and also on your favorite panelists, and you're voting over Twitter. And the winners of those contests win uh, some lovely prizes. So just out of curiosity, how many people here use Twitter and might be voting today? All right, so that's like half or more, right? It's a little bit more than I was expecting, so that's great. Those of you who, who are on Twitter have undue influence here, and you'll be deciding the winners and losers tonight. Um, after the, the awards, we're going to go over to Murphy and Gonzalez, which is about two blocks away, uh, for drinks. So uh, I'm going to introduce the panel in a second, but before I do that, I want to say that I want to thank uh, a number of partners that have been extremely uh, instrumental in making this a success. Um, and filling out the room today and bringing in some great uh, presenters and some great panelists and uh, bringing in the, in the content that we have here. So first and foremost, Willem Rensink, our lead platinum sponsor from Shell Game Changer, who's going to be talking about uh, uh, Game Changer in a little bit. But thank you very much for really making this happen. Mike Shimazu from Nicerda, right over there. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'm going to give these people maybe five or ten seconds to say if there's, if there's one thing that you want to announce. Uh, we'll give you a, 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 a section later on, but Mike Shimazu from, from NYSERDA. Uh, Micah Koch from NYC Acre, right over here. Micah's the most well-connected guy in uh, clean tech in New York City, and he's also based on the incubator where I am. It's been super, super helpful in uh, connecting me with everybody here. Sandy Kreis in the back there with CB Insights and Green Capital Empire. Green Capital Empire is launching tom tomorrow, tomorrow evening. Follow us at Green Cap Empire on Twitter, and it's www.greencapitalempire.com. OK. Bring together investors, startups, and certain providers within the Fantastic. Also another NYSERDA project. Thanks so much, Matt. OK. Uh, Nick Davis and Andre Riccardi from Agrion. Nick, somewhere around here. He was here before, um, has been very helpful. David Hockman, my personal coach for the uh, incubator uh, world. Thank you very much, David. Ali Adler, Clean Tech Open. And you have an announcement. There's an event tomorrow yeah. at Mince Levin. What do you want to say about it? Awesome. Thank you so much, Ali, all the way down from Boston today for, uh, for this event and, and for her event tomorrow. Um, J.E. Emmingham and Brian Blauvelt from Energy Infotech NYC. 
are here. They've been extremely helpful. Chelsea Meyer and Jacob Bleiberg from the Stern Energy Club. Jacob and Chelsea, uh, do you guys want to say something about Stern Energy Club? Wonderful. Thank you, guys. Co-hosting us here tonight at, uh, at Stern, providing this lovely venue for us. Um, Jonathan McClellan of Energy Drinks and NYAE. Jonathan here? Probably on his way. Okay. All the presenters. We have one out of eight companies that are presenting tonight. Only one is from New York City. Uh, seven others are from everywhere, from Maine to D.C. to Philadelphia, Boston, Buffalo, so not only coming here and, and applying, but making, making an effort to get here. So thank you very much. And lastly, my co-host and partner, uh, Chris DeLuca, who is from Boston, but he actually traveled further than anybody here to get here today. He was on family vacation. His wife and his daughter are in Cancun right now. He cut short his vacation to fly back for this event. That, that is dedication. I should, a, I should get a lot of tweets for he should, he should. Too bad that there's no contest for us, but otherwise I'm sure you'd win it. Um, awesome. So, here's our panel. So we're going to start to my right, uh, in alphabetic order, Jiang Ma from um, Braemar Energy Ventures. So just tell a little bit about what Braemar is, and uh, what we usually do is your last investment and why you're so excited about it. And there's a, there's a microphone here. Yeah, go ahead. Just speak into it. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for Let's coming. Um, so, Brema Energy Venture, it's a New York and Boston-based, uh, East Coast-based, uh, you know, fund, primarily focused on energy technology investment. Uh, we are on a investing currently on our third fund. Uh, the, so, we have about... 35 companies we invested uh, across between energy efficiency and energy generation. We have uh, about nine investment professionals in, in between uh, New York and Boston. Uh, but we invest globally. We invest in uh, New York and uh, East Coast, West Coast, and Europe and Asia. So uh, pretty broad. Uh, that we, uh, last investment. We have a couple more, sorry, in the pipeline. Uh, I guess, um, the one that we really excited now, we haven't really been announced. Maybe I should not say it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, Breaking news right here at Future uh, Energy. <laughs> uh, so I, I would say um, we uh, made a new investment recently in the energy, uh, sort of the uh, seed investment in the agriculture space for the feedstock. So that, that's really exciting. Okay. Energy feedstock. Yeah. Thank you very much, Young. So, Ann Partlow from Earthrise Capital. Um, tell, us, tell us about Earthrise and uh, your last investment. Okay. Earthrise Capital is a New York-based venture capital firm that I founded a few years ago. We're um, only here in New York. There are two partners, so we're small. We've made um, three investments so far, and we'll make a few more. Our latest investment was a biomass services company. It's a pricing database for lumber and um, biomass services industry, um, particularly now that a lot of um, wood chips and wood um, pellets are being sent to Europe for um, co-firing and coal plants there. So that is a, that's a profitable company, a little different from our usual early stage startup companies. We're happy to be here tonight and look forward to hearing more about this. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ann. And Willem Rensink from Shell International. Yeah, so my name is uh, Willem Rensink. I'm with uh, Shell uh, and in the, our Game Changer team. And a little bit why we're sort of interested in sponsoring and sort of enable this event for, uh, for, for, for Graham and Chris and ultralight startups to, to come here and reach out. So the way, the way we see it is sort of more everyone here and probably in the room is, is interested in future energies. And the way Shell faces that is, uh, is that we see what we see the reality of an increase in demand and the supply will keep up, you know, has a hard time keeping up with that, uh, that demand increase. 
and we see a, rapid, a need for rapid growth in renewables. And then also we see environmental stresses increases. So we hope with, the, with partnering here to reach out to the communities of people that are developing solutions and help enabling solutions, bringing together people with ideas and investors, uh, and in that way see whether, whether we can contribute to, to these challenges. Um, usually we keep microphones away from me. Um, <laughs> Sp my name speak is close in because uh, we're, we're recording this. Okay, so. sure. Uh, my name is Yaniv Swissa. I work at NEA. NEA is the largest venture capital fund in the world. $15 billion under management, $2.5 billion fund. Clean tech, tech, and healthcare. I do clean tech and tech. In clean tech, we have over 35 companies, over a billion dollars invested, and that's across almost all sectors. Um, my most recent investment was actually a tech company, because I also do tech, um, but, and I'm about to invest in an energy company that I probably shouldn't tell anyone about. But the most recent, probably I'd say, is a follow-on round that we did in Opower, which is one of our seed investments, which a lot of people probably know about. And I'm excited because they're kicking butt. What does Opower uh, do? Opower is an energy efficiency management system, let's call it, that is a behavioral play. So it'll tell you, it works with utilities, it strikes deals with utilities, analyzes their data, and then will send you, uh, part of your bill you'll get an analysis that will say, hey, Joe, you're spending 10 times more than your neighbor on energy and you're the bottom 1% of wasters of energy, the top 1% of wasters of energy in your community and your neighbor thinks you suck. And you will end up saving a ton of, and these people end up saving quite a significant amount of energy as a result um, because it's a behavioral analysis type of thing and they're moving into energy efficiency um, internationally as well. Okay. Thank you so much, Leonid. So, fantastic panel today. So, this is the uh, format of the pitch. Chris, you want to talk about that in the contest? Sure, thanks, Graham. So, we've got an exciting pitch competition this evening. Um, hopefully you didn't create a you know, Twitter account just for the pitch and you're active users. Um, so we've got basically this format where you're going to be pitching. Uh, the, p the pitchers will be um, competing for the top three prizes and then there'll also be a competition amongst the panels. So you'll be able to vote for your panelists as well. Uh, and the format is basically you've got three, three minutes for the pitch, three minutes for questions, and three minutes for actionable feedback coming from the panel. As this is happening progressively throughout the evening, you can pitch, um, you can vote for the pitchers by submitting one clean tweet that's ultralight, pound ultralight, including the startup's uh, Twitter handle. So that's all you need to do to actually submit one vote. And you can vote as many times as you want for as many com companies as you want. Uh, and similarly, the same format for the panel, it's pound ultralight and the panelist handle. Perfect. Um, here are some of the prizes that you win. Um, for the startups, the top three startups are going to win some combination of uh, a free application to Cleantech Open Northeast, Ali mentioned earlier, uh, a presentation at Agrion, which is a, a network of uh, uh, corporations and their uh, sustainability officers, um, uh, pitch to New York Angels, which is the largest angel investor network in New York City, uh, Amazon Web Services credit, and media training. Those are the top three uh, Best startups are going to win. Are going to win those, uh, and the panel prize. So our best panelist is going to win our enduring gratitude and uh, <laughs> bragging rights. <laughs> we have we have nothing else beyond that. But that should be that should be plenty. That's really the, that's where the excitement is, anyways. Uh, okay, so we're going to start with our pitches. So the first one in the lineup today is Brian Asparo of Green Charge Networks. So come on down, Chris. Come on down, Brian. Oh, here we go. So, and then Adam Ryan from Alteros, just hang out maybe over here in the on deck circle if you if you can. We're gonna try and make it through, make it through this quickly. Okay, so you have three minutes, Brian. We're gonna keep you very tight on the time here. Don't so, have a, there's no ticker, is there anywhere? It, here. It's just with me. <laughs> Okay, guilty. I'm the one from New York, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, hi. Uh, I'm Brian Asparo. I'm the CFO of Green Charge Networks. Um, we are a software company that integrates uh, energy storage systems with the uh, facility energy load um, by integrating that software uh, through solar panels, uh, distributed generation, and um, also with the uh, loads at the site, things like refrigeration, HVAC, and uh, electric vehicle chargers. 
Uh, we have uh, won a grant uh, in 2009 with the Department of Energy to work with uh, Con Edison. It was a $12.7 million grant, and uh, it was basically for helping us work with companies uh, like 7-Eleven, Avis, and Whole Foods to uh, integrate our storage systems at the site. So there's three things that set us apart from uh, other companies. One is our experience in working with Con Edison. We've worked with Con Ed for the last four years, building software and understanding exactly what the types of profiles that cause demand charges and will help them also uh, move, up, move forward with their demand response-based programs. So um, that's the first thing. The second thing, through that development, we have uh, developed control software that resides at the site and uh, tells the system what to do. The main goal of which is to reduce energy costs and then also to um, help the customers be a part of demand response based programs. Um, this, the third thing is the NOC. Oh, you can go back. Is the NOC that we have. And that resides right between our customers and the utility. And what the NOC does is it uh, communicates directly with all of our installations in the field. We currently have 12 beta sites uh, working with 7-Eleven, Avis, and Whole Foods. And we um, enact demand response-based programs and also tell the, the systems, uh, look, manage the system health, et cetera, et cetera. Our revenue model is, uh, is currently based two-thirds product and one-third software, um, software maintenance. We um, also uh, get a, a portion of the uh, energy savings for a site. So um, in this case, uh, for customers like 7-Eleven, we have uh, already modeled out within our architecture um, a three to five year payback period, which is a, a period that a lot of energy, uh, a lot of the energy um, uh, profiles uh, for the retailers that they'll invest in. We um, we're 30 employees, uh, majority of which are software developers and uh, mechanical and electrical engineers. We're based both in Brooklyn and in um, Southern California. We have. We have 25 patents uh, filed, uh, several of which have gone through USPTO. And our management team has a history in entrepreneurship, um, energy, uh, and working at companies such as A123 uh, International Battery. And time. Am I really cut off? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great job. Well done. So let's open it up to the panel a little bit. Um, so what questions would you like to ask to maybe understand a little bit more about the business model? Sure. We can start with, oh, with Yana. Yeah. I just was curious about the proprietary nature. Is it software mainly that is proprietary in your patent? The software is, sorry, the software is proprietary. Um, the, the patents are basically built around a lot of the, the process with the control software. And then also for the, the knock that we have that uh, in, a, in interfaces with the installations. And is the system automatic when you have to curtail energy or does someone have to call up? And Good ask? question. So um, the system, we, we install an energy monitoring device that uh, manages the energy profile real time and shows exactly what's causing the demand. And based on that, we've, the control software acts on a second by second basis. So when a profile is in increasing quite a bit, the, the battery will go on as a result, to mitigate demand charges and to reduce energy costs. Yeah. What kind of hardware is required for your software to work, um, and what kind of integration is required for that hardware, both in terms of what you're developing to provide your service, but also what um, the that's called utility needs to have in existence for it to work? Sure. So um, we work. Uh, the main component of our system, lithium-ion batteries anywhere between 50 to 200 kilowatt size systems. Um, we, we do integration, so we do the integration at our uh, lab in Southern California, and um, it's, we have partners who install these, these systems. Uh, what we do is the connection point between our, the, the site, it's a, um, uh, a wireless connection between the site and our network operations center that um, shows the system health and um, allows us to do maintenance on the site as well. Uh, maybe I'm confused. So you're actually building batteries? No, nope, nope, not building. Integrate. So we um, buy the batteries, and then they get installed. And we just integrate the software on top of it, telling the battery what to do. It integrates uh, with, the, okay. with the building man uh, battery management system. Yeah. 
Question, John? Uh, yes, I, I have a question on a three to five year payback. Are they based on any incentives or, or you know, it's sort of very long payback period. I'm just curious how you calculate that. Sure. Um, it's based on, there are tax uh, incentives along with that, uh, but it's based on our knowledge. We collect data within our NOC from the site in addition to getting um, access to all their energy bills as well. And based on that, uh, we've modeled out the right-sized equipment for that site. So a lot of times you would you know, install a battery and it would be a very large battery where the payback would be not, not as good. So we have um, modeled out that. But the main components in there would be battery, software, and then installation. And, we'll, and, and, and so where do the major uh, energy saving costs come from? Major energy savings costs come from um, mitigating demand charges, um, also uh, automated demand response. So we had a meeting with the Department of Energy last week, and they were very interested in our software and the ability to offer automated demand response. Utilities are looking to offer demand response on a pretty real-time basis. Um, you know, they have various programs. You can offer your energy in 24 hours. You can offer your energy within 30 minutes, and this is real-time. So the software that we've built that resides in our NOC is based on uh, work that we've done with, with uh, Con Edison to determine exactly where the issues are in the grid, whether it's Long Island City or it's Brooklyn, and, and in that regard, um, then calling, you know, developing the rules that will be developed that day uh, um, Con Ed could, could interact with. But this resides uh, not on the uh, utility side. It, it's, it, we're right in the middle of the utility and the, uh, and the installations and our customers. Perfect, solid three minutes of questions. So, as you can see, this is the you know the opportunity for you to probe at the at the at the business, understand a little bit more background. Now we're going to move right into the feedback session of the of the format. So we're going to go right through the panel again, and this is your chance to actually you know give give a piece of you know actionable advice, a piece of feedback uh, to Brian and what he should do with uh, Green Charge Networks. What would you do if you were Brian and you, you had to go home and run Green Charge Networks tomorrow? Yaniv. <laughs> I was going to be all critical. I got to be uh, productive too. You can be um, critical. I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's a really crowded space, and it's crowded for a reason. Um, it's because each of these individual. Pro it's good that you have a relationship with Con Edison, but each of these individual operators have very different infrastructures and de very different requirements, which limits the size that your company can ultimately become from an investment perspective. Because it's not going to what you're building is not going to be applicable to everybody else. Um, my productive piece of advice would be. Uh, lithium-ion battery, A123 and lithium-ion batteries are not doing so well for a reason. Um, I would investigate those reasons further rather than me taking too much time to explain them um, and consider some of the newer technologies that are out there um, that are a lot more efficient and kind of gaining steam with some of the big players. Yeah, to, to, to me, it would be like uh, how do you define your exact customer, right, or which needs are you serving? Because I think you've got, you got good examples on how, how you would scale that. And, and, and the way I see it is, is, is the battery, if that's the key sort of technology piece that ties it together, there I would be worried that how big can you really make it for, for a business and then eventually how many, how many customers can you serve with the, with the particular solution. Yeah. Speak right into the mic if you can, close. Yeah, I think the same uh, point about the battery. I would look into something like a lead carbon, a much cheaper battery solution to reduce payback and also we didn't get into it a lot, but uh, installation costs can be really a big barrier um, to profitability here. Sure. And Joe? Uh, I, I guess I um, shared a lot of comments uh, the other panelists made. Um, seems to be a battery is a really uh, hurdle here in the cost side. And uh, so if there's any other way to look at flow batteries, other ways to really reduce the payback period, so you can really drive the adoption. So that's sort of key. Another way is so looking at collaboration. You know, you don't do the hardware piece, but really utilize your software capabilities. That's probably where your differentiation can come in. Uh, so maybe finding partners to kind of help on that. That will be helpful, I think. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, in terms of the battery, we... we right. No, no during, questions. During oh, no. the feedback side. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you I was trying to slip that by you. You've <laughs> first, so you've been the example. So during the feedback part, there's, no, there's actually no follow-up. Thank you very much. Great so, job, Brian. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. So we should mention uh, voting. So if you'd like to vote for Green Charge Networks, send a tweet with pound ultralight.
and at Green Charge. Uh, also, you can vote for your favorite panelists and their uh, wonderful and insightful advice uh, using Pound Ultralight and their Twitter handle, respectively. So, yeah, I'll bring it up. All right, so up next we have Adam Ryan from Alteros Energies, uh, traveling all the way from Boston, or Massachusetts. You have three minutes, thanks. Good evening, everyone. I'm Adam Ryan, uh, joined by Alain Goubeau. We're co-founders of Alteros Energies. Our team comes out of MIT, and we're adapting low-cost aerospace materials to make the first truly uh, ultra-light wind turbine. Uh, as you know, wind turbines today are very heavy, they use large cranes to lift onto large steel towers, which can drive up to 50% of the total cost of a system, especially at remote sites. What we have done is developed an inflatable helium-filled shell that lifts the wind turbine higher in the air, uh, where winds are stronger, using synthetic tethers to hold it in place and send the power down to the ground. The entire system operates very high, or when winds are strong, go down to the ground and operate from a mobile docking trailer. Um, why do we have an advantage over current technology? First, um, in the renewable energy, the strength of the resource is very important. Winds at 1,000 feet are five to eight times more power density than winds at 100 feet, where typical mid-sized turbines deploy. And secondly, uh, we adapt our technology from tethered aerostats, which we like to call the industrial cousins of Goodyear blimps. Today, systems like these are used by the military and other customers to lift multi-ton payloads into the air for long periods of time, uh, and they're rapidly deployable. Um, this smaller system can set up in five minutes out of the back of a truck. Um, not only does this allow us to be an extremely capital-efficient wind energy company, by adapting all of our components from proven technology, but it also gives us an established uh, permitting framework to deploy with the FAA. Um, so we'll show you a quick video. Um, Alan and I just got back from six months in Maine, uh, um, building our first uh, large-scale prototype. So this is a 35-foot-long prototype of our technology, which we built for $75,000 of materials. Uh, as you can see, the, the helium inside the inflatable shell lifts it up into the air. Um, that's a conventional off-the-shelf wind turbine located in the center. Uh, we tested this up 350 feet high, the height of the tallest wind turbines in the world today, uh, and had the entire system autonomously developed so it could lift itself to harness strong winds or come down to this mobile trailer uh, and produce power from the ground when winds were too strong. Um, the system produced over two times the power at the high altitude than it produces off of a typical turbine uh, height. Uh, and finally, another key demonstration is that the entire system could be towed on the back of a truck, Ten something seconds. that's very hard to do with a tall tower. So we just uh, completed our seed round and are going to go out to a Series A. We have four patents filed. We're looking for more partners. So thank you very much. That's time. Great job. <laughs> Great, great job, Adam. So let's take some questions from the panel. Uh, John, would you like to go first? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, um, I guess uh, it's a very, uh, I mean, it's a very uh, interesting, exciting project, and uh, we know there's a bunch of uh, uh, people in this area actually looking at um, developing this product. I guess the question is really, um, have you looked at really the market size? Is it really uh, big enough? So really, uh, so I, mean, I have a lot of questions. I'm looking at the competition and the market size, and uh, and also looking at um, infrastructure, how do you really get power to, you know, the users actually, right? Mm -hmm. So is this sort of the more uh, manufacturing or farm, sort of the very niche market applications? Speak into the mic, Ed. Uh, okay. Sorry. I'll, 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 I can restate your question. Okay. Um, so she asked about the market size and the infrastructure needed to deploy it. So uh, our first product will be um, not much bigger than that prototype, targeting the $18 billion dollar off-grid energy market. This is uh, uh, markets that are serviced by 
uh, big diesel generators today and have a cost of energy typically above 50 cents per kilowatt hour, military bases, oil and gas and other industrial sites, and remote villages. The long-term vision is to scale it up to um, offshore utility-scale wind farms, particularly in deep water areas where you can't have giant towers underwater. Um, and your second question was on um, the market and the competition. Yes. So about $100 million has been invested in high-altitude wind turbines. People recognize that this is one of the biggest untapped renewable resources. Um, people have designs that look like helicopters and UAVs. Uh, our team has had an approach which is to base all of our components on proven technology, which although is somewhat higher cost, we think gives us a huge advantage in terms of reliability, uh, capital efficiency, and permitting. Question from Willen. Yeah, so the, the prototype you show, what, what's, how much power can that generate? Yeah, it's sized to be a 15 kilowatt uh, prototype. Our first product will be 30 kilowatts. We actually only put in a two and a half kilowatt Southwest Skystream, the top, small, top selling small wind turbine in the world, namely because you need a lightweight wind turbine to lift because helium can only lift so much. So what we're going to raise funding to do is basically convert an off-the-shelf wind turbine with lighter weight component structural materials to, uh, while using the same generator and architecture. So did the, the prototype, did it have uh, a real cable to the ground to be yeah, able to power so, down? Yeah, so we produce typically in low and moderate wind speeds. Uh, and when we uh, were deploying the Southwest turbine, it would produce about five or six watts at its tower height. And we got over twice the power when we were lifting it up two or 300 feet in the air. So the weight of the cable is not a problem if you go higher? And, no. And higher Luckily, power. these aerostats already use up to 30 kilowatt conductive cables to send power up. This is a, a two-ton radar system. So we're using uh, just adapting the tethers directly from the sect sector. Question from Ann. Uh, and how will you scale up? I mean, a lot of turbines now to be economic are three, four megawatts even, or probably larger um, in future. And you said there's a limit to how much helium helium can lift. So do you see the, pro the path to uh, making very large turbines in your system? Yeah. So our first goal is really to build a business in the off-grid market where we don't have to go into that area. Uh, but over time, we're really looking at high-cost electricity areas where we can bring costs lower. Um, certainly, these are fairly small scale in the helium inflatables world. For something much smaller than a Goodyear blimp, you can lift up a megawatt scale turbine as well, uh, and specifically in the offshore area where you have a lot more space to operate. Um, so the limit's around a megawatt, you think? Uh, no, we're looking at uh, anything from a two to four megawatt two to four. system. Yeah. Oh. And the materials, have you... Are they tested in other areas, or is this some new material you use? No, it's actually we're using similar materials. Uh, these use something like a, a high-performance cloth you see on sailboats. It's very similar with a helium shield. We work with ILC Dover, which used to make the spacesuits for the Apollo mission, and now they make most of the envelopes for blimps and aerostats. Yeah, on, on a, so I'm assuming you lose quite a bit of energy in the transmission from up high to, to the grid. Um, that may be an incorrect assumption, so you can correct that. Yeah. Um, if that is the case, what's the cost comparison? So how many, uh, what's the cost differential between a, a normal standalone turbine on yep. a pole versus what you guys are building? So uh, we would send down the power with medium voltage DC power and do the uh, conversion to AC on the ground. And so the losses are very low. We look at um, less than 2%. Uh, and we benchmark against a 100 kilowatt uh, Northwind 100, the biggest best-selling 100 kilowatt system. Our capital cost is about the same, but we produce between three to five times the energy and uh, reduce the installation time from a month to less than a day. So we're particularly excited about customers who don't want a tower at their site for 20 years, uh, specifically in the military oil and gas sector. Beyond simply a lower cost of energy, we're actually able to sell a product where other renewable solutions can't go. Just a real quick follow-up. So you're comparing to 100 kilowatts, so you're going to have one less tower, but five or six of these, right? No. So a 30 kilowatt is our first product, but then we're okay. following on with a 100 kilowatt product. Let's okay. take one question from the audience. So would any, anyone in the audience like to ask any, any question of Adam? No? Yes, one. Yeah. If you could repeat the question as well. Yeah, so um, 
two megawatt wind turbines produce energy depending on how strong the winds are. So in West Texas, you can get energy competitive with uh, you know, fossil fuels, but in uh, the other 85% of sites, uh, like here in the Northeast, you need subsidies to build megawatt scale wind turbines. So what we're trying to do is expand the potential of wind energy by finding this higher altitude resource. Uh, the cost of a small system isn't competitive with the grid, um, but that's why we're looking at off-grid markets that are using expensive diesel generators as our first market. Thank you, Henry. Let's, so let's move into the feedback session. Remember, there's no follow-up during this part. So, um, Jung, anyone, any order, would you like to, where would you like to start with giving feedback to Adam? Uh, sure, I can, I can, just, I can start. Um, so, Adam, I, I think this is a um, very exciting you know, sort of uh, idea. And uh, we see, uh, as I mentioned before, we see a lot of uh, kind of entrepreneurs you know, trying to accomplish right this. So uh, yeah, okay. And uh, so my, I guess my approach on this is uh, there's two things, right? One's really um, maybe a find a partner like a manu, you know, like GM or, or Ford manufacturing plant. Maybe you know there you don't have sort of the aviation issues. You have a large piece of land, so um, so you can really uh, do some experiments because you don't need to go, go sort of permitting or the aviation other issues, or a farm. So that's sort of the pick a, pick a partner and, uh, and demonstrate if you can do even one megawatt, not the, I mean, 15 kilowatts, probably too small. Um, next thing is really, really, I guess you haven't really addressed uh, sort of the weather issues, you know, storm weather. How, how do you deal in that situation? Because you want to have a reliable, constant power supplier. I mean, how do you really address those kind of unpredictable situations you haven't addressed? So those are two, my two comments. Thank you. Great. And yes? Straight into the mic. Um, I, you know, I think this is um, interesting, as John said, and rather challenging area now for, for entrepreneurs because of the U.S. policy on wind. It's not very consistent. And so I just wonder whether you might have better luck offshore somewhere or another another country that's more amenable to this kind of thing. But I think well, it's very interesting. Yeah, so I had one comment is that I think if you look at, you mentioned that it's difficult to compete at cost with existing windmills. So one angle you might use is also the life cycle analyses that, you know, you use much less building materials. So sort of on a carbon payback time, you might be doing much better even if you're sort of on cost, a cost parity with, uh, with a traditional windmill. The other thing I had is that you mentioned you have a few patents filed, but yes, you start using a lot of known components then, you know, to make sure that, that you keep enough differentiated technology components in there before somebody else might be able to move on you. Because there's a lot of people, you know, I've seen quite a few of these types of ideas. And yeah, um, So two major comments. One is an oddity that I learned in the government that I probably shouldn't say because shouldn't say I'm going to get shot. But um, it's that when you start lifting things high that spin, there are national security issues um, with it that a lot of people don't talk about, but it's worth investigating. There's stuff about it out there. I'll leave it at that. Um, the other thing is, um, so community wind really has two problems that you should be thinking about. Um, the first is community. Um, so uh, from that perspective, security and aesthetic matters a lot. So the way it looks has actually been one of the uh, problems for the, for the big balloon type wind turbines. And also the notion that it could pop. I mean, this is probably not reality, but not in my not in my backyard. If a balloon's going to pop and a giant helicopter is going to come flying at my house, it's it's a concern, right? Um, and the other the other the other part of it, and I know that's probably not what happens, but it's an issue. Um, and the other community wind aspect is the financing. So all of the community wind companies we have seen have failed because they have been unable to figure out a financing mechanism for community wind. Um, and that involves relationships with banks, interesting structuring of financial deals, you know, finding a way to put forth capital and advance. And so those are, those are relationships that could be built, but you really have to think about those. It's got to be more than just the technology. Fantastic, Fantastic feedback. So round of applause for Adam at Altero. Great job. And make sure, make sure you're voting. Make sure you're voting for the company. So if you'd like to vote for Adam at Alteros, it's going to be at Alteros Energies, Inc., uh, and make sure you're including the pound ultralight uh, in the tweet. And then also make sure you're voting for your panel as well. So, Awesome. Job. So we have Beth Stewart from United Catalyst is up next. And on deck, Nathan Ball of Gnomes Technologies. There you go. Three minutes. 
Hi there. Uh, my name is Beth Stewart. I am the business manager of United Catalyst. Uh, Dr. Stephen Roth, the uh, principal uh, founder, is also here with me tonight as well. And we are a very early stage chemical catalyst company focused in the advanced biofuels industry. Um, we're seeking seed stage capital right now um, to further optimize our overall technology, which is a chemical catalyst. We're going to optimize that technology um, over the next six months. And by the end of this year, we will be running a pilot um, and uh, commercializing the rest of our technology. So our core technology is actually a chemical catalyst that's used in cellulosic biofuels. Um, these are biofuels uh, like ethanol or biobutanol that are made from cellulose as opposed to corn crops um, or sugar, uh, like you hear of most uh, ethanol. Um, there are many catalysts that are currently used in oil refining, um, petroleum cracking industry that are silica based. What our technology does is basically imprint a cellulose molecule in a silica uh, catalyst. Um, so the novelty is really the imprinting technology with a, cel uh, a, cel a cellulose molecule. Um, so why is this disruptive? What does this imprinting technology do that's really disruptive? Um, our technology actually uh, acts as an artificial enzyme. Traditionally, enzymes are used to release the sugar that's found in cellulose, and these enzymes are extremely expensive and very difficult to work with. Um, and it's been a hurdle to really large-scale commercialization of cellulosic ethanol. Um, so right now we have an early-stage technology that can replace the need for the uh, enzyme, and we can be about less than a third of the cost of the actual enzyme from a material standpoint. But using a silica-based catalyst will provide many more operating efficiencies across an entire uh, biofuel plant. And I could talk a little bit more about those. So how can this impact the overall economics of producing biofuels? Number one, we can operate um, as a, a product that is manufactured off-site and shipped in, as opposed to most enzymes that are manufactured on-site, and you have a lot of capital expenditures associated with manufacturing enzymes on-site. Um, one of the other things that you'll see, not only are we one-third of the cost of traditional enzymes from a material standpoint, but operating at over 120 degrees Celsius, higher than the boiling temperature of water, you'll be able to realize a lot of operating efficiencies across a biofuel plant um, associated with uh, energy savings, uh, the decreased viscosity, no need for cooling in between different phases of the manufacturing process, um, and less pressure in order to move biomass slurries through a manufacturing plant. Ten seconds. And then finally, the yield, um, the high temperature of over 120 degrees Celsius will provide no contaminants going into the fermentation cycle, which will provide consistently high batch quality time after time, which is a consistent um, uh, improvement in what we see today. And time. Thank you. Great job. Thanks, Bob. Great, great job, Beth. So let's give some questions to Beth from the panel. Um, William, would you, like to go, would you like to go first? Yeah. So where does, if you, if you, have you been able to prototype the, the biocatalyst or the, the silica catalyst to date as a, as a material to test for hydrolysis? Um, we've manufactured um, the catalyst in a laboratory setting, and we have done experiments and proved that we could cleave the glucose from the cellulose. We'd like to optimize that manufacturing of the catalyst ourselves at this point and try uh, optimization with larger size cellulose molecules at this point. And, and so what's your benchmarking to sort of the leading enzyme packages? Um, I'm sorry, benchmarking? Like if you look at sort of the current sort of Novozymes, Genencore, the current, you know, cellulosic ethanol packages that are out there, how, how do you compare currently and, and where do you need to be to sort of beat their, uh, their performance? Um, well, that's one of the things that we're trying to optimize. Um, because we have very little data, it's kind of like a moving target looking at enzymes that are available today. Every one of the cocktails of enzymes per biofuel plant is really designed specific to the feedstock and the process of that plant. Um, so we're really trying to benchmark and gain data right now as to the specific activity that we need to match. Um, and the, uh, we already know we can beat the temperatures that are um, being shown well over 120 degrees. And, and what about the rates? Are you, are you faster or similar or slower? Um, right now we're slower. Um, we've not yet optimized our catalyst, but we're slower on a gram for gram basis. So once, I mean, you can increase the overall enzyme loading 
um, the artificial enzyme or catalyst, you can increase that well over what you can do with an enzyme because we're so much cheaper uh, than the enzyme would be. So ultimately, we'd be able to match the specific activity of the enzymes um, at, still at a lower cost. Yes, Yanni. Uh, it sounds like your last comment was a little worrying to me because you said you have to match to multiple different types of processes and multiple different types of inputs. Um, how do you deal with the R&D and the cost of that? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, right now, we're looking at the business model is actually going to be an engineering, a sales and engineering company, and the catalyst is actually going to be outsourced manufactured by people who make these today. Um, so each uh, plant or customer, we're going to take a look at their process, their feedstock, and come up with the right mix of our catalyst, some imprinted with hemicellulose, some imprinted with cellulose, different size molecules, so that we can offer them a cocktail very similar to what the enzyme industry does today, but this would be of an artificial enzyme, a silica-based catalyst. But the, the cocktail will have to be different for every different type of company and therefore different production of that we would, enzyme, well, right? It would be a different mixture, basically a recipe, but you'd be able to start with the same basic catalyst to design and manufacture it, but then how much you load of each type would be different based upon the feedstock and the process. And, and the last question on this is, what, from what I understand, a lot we don't do a lot of bioinvesting for uh, for part of, partly this reason. That from what I understand is a lot of the bio with the bioenzymes and things they change, right? Because it's biology, right? They change pretty regularly, mm -hmm. and so you have to have a lot of R and D and a lot of expenditure going into constantly fixing and tweaking and and changing your secret sauce. Let's call it right. Um, is that the same case with the technology you're building? And if if it's not, then why? And if it is, how do you deal with the capital cost of that? Um, I think I can answer your question. It's, I, I understand with enzymes, you're constantly recreating and trying to come up with a better enzyme, a better enzyme. Um, this is actually, it, it's a mechanical process. The, the catalyst acts as an enzyme, but once it's designed, you're really just going to be optimizing the way you imprint it. So it was more along the fact, think of like a virus, right? Mm -hmm. How it change, the same virus just changes, Mutate. and so you become um, immune to one virus, but then you have flu number 248 and then mm -hmm. flu number 382 and you have to constantly be changing the vaccine, right? Correct. Is that the same situation with this? That's the question. Uh, I understand. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think the biomass, um, you know, say it's corn stover or wheat straw, that's going to stay the same. Our catalyst will replace enzymes. There won't be a need for enzymes on the plant. The, the enzyme will act, uh, the artificial enzyme, the catalyst will be used in the hydrolysis process. So we'll be working with a feedstock that's consistent at the plant constantly consistent, and there's not going to be any enzyme interrupting that space. Let's take another question from the, from the panel. Uh, Anne, would you like to ask a question? So if the feedstock varies in any way, the, en the enzyme would have to be changed or your product would have to be changed? Uh, no, the feedstock from a biomass plant would pretty much be consistent, um, and we wouldn't see a lot of variability, but it really wouldn't take too much tweaking. I mean, once the catalyst is manufactured, it's really just a recipe that would be slightly altered. Uh, once, the, once we optimize the manufacturing of the catalyst in our laboratory, the recipe uh, would just be altered based upon the feedstock. And have you worked with any potential partners so far or dis had discussions with them? Yes, we've had uh, several discussions with... Um, uh, corporations both in the enzyme business and in the catalyst business. Um, we've also talked to some feedstock uh, uh, customers that have a lot of feedstock that we're looking at our technology. And a final question from Joan. Okay, uh, I, I think the other panelists asked some very good questions. This is one question. Um, from you know, initial development to really adoption of a new catalyst takes many years probably. Um, you know, what is your estimation? How many years you think from a concept to really adoption? Uh, you probably want to have the one through you know, many period of uh, testing and also, um, I mean, have you thought about the business model here? Is it really a consulting business or is it really a licensing business? So that's the question, yeah. Okay, well, the, uh, the manufacturing of the catalyst would be outsourced to a licensed partner to manufacture. We would be the sales front end and the engineering based, uh, custom engineering for each plant. Um, the uh, catalyst has proven to have specific activity at this point. We're going to optimize it over this next six months. There are currently the immediate target market is 21 plants that are going to be built using enzymatic hydrolysis in the next four years. There's another 30 plants that are also being built that are on a smaller scale 
um, not the commercial size, but 21 plants are commercial scale. So these are things that are in development right now where we can offer them a solution that would save them overall process cost. So we took a little bit of extra time um, with the question section, so we're going to move a little quicker on the feedback part of it. So, um, Zhang, if we'd like to just start right back with you, what, you know, what piece of, of advice or um, productive recommendation would you like to, to give back? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think, you know, your targeting area is really a growth area, definitely, and because we have made a couple of investments in this year as well, um, not particularly on the enzyme. Um, so I would say, um, again, I, I would start, you know, finding a, a um, partner to really, you know, sort of uh, test some of your initial solutions or product. You really have a good understanding about how long it takes to really push the solutions to the market. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Recommendation, Anne? Yeah. I would agree with that. I think working closely maybe with someone in one type of feedstock or maybe two at the most and um, trying to perfect it for those areas to, to prove this the best you can. Okay, thank you. So, so my suggestion would be to sort of shorter your time to market to go for a hybrid approach until your enzyme catalyst, catalyst, silica catalyst is good enough and see can you reduce the enzyme loading rather than replace it, right? So run more of a hybrid model okay. so you don't need all this ancillary activity to break down the, hydro, you know, the, uh, the, the biomass to sort of the monomeric sugars that you need so really, because that saves you a lot of R&D and a lot of com competition. And also, I think the capital intensity of the biorefineries is still high. So even if these plans are announced, you know, they might not materialize. So I definitely see where the imprinting technology translates to all the areas of industrial enzymes. And that way, sort of hedge your bet a little bit against the, uh, the biorefineries. And then, um, all form of life changes and adapts. And I think you're really underestimating that part. So I would think about... Um, how you're going to have to change this over time. You're going to need multiple versions, I think, of the same enzyme. Um, and I would think about how you fun fund that and finance that. And the, and the last thing is, um, I worry that you're selling into a market. Uh, what you're selling may be a great technology, but you're selling it to a market that I think is decreasing and um, having a lot of trouble growing for the biofuels market. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would think about other applications to the technology that allow you to maintain market share if biofuels has trouble. Fantastic feedback. Congratulations. Good job. Thanks, Beth. So make sure you're voting. Make sure you're voting on Twitter. Uh, yeah. Um, so to vote for United Catalyst, it is uh, Pound Ultralight. Send a tweet with Pound Ultralight and at United Catalyst. Uh, also, you can vote for our panelists and their fantastic advice. Um, next up, we have Nathan Ball of Gnomes Technologies. Then we're going to take a break. You want to talk about? Yeah, I should just, uh, should just mention real quick the fire exits um, are available on the upper left and upper right uh, of what, the way you came in. So just just an important announcement that make sure you know where they are. <laughs> okay. We talk about fire exits before the battery guy comes on board. <laughs> You've got three minutes. Good evening. My name is Nathan Ball, Gnomes Technologies, uh, and we make battery we make materials and components for lithium-ion batteries that are. Much less, much less expensive, much more powerful, and safe, and very, 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 very safe. Um, using our materials and components, a uh, cell manufacturer like A123 Systems could make a battery that is uh, two and a half times more energy dense than lead acid, ten, more energy dense than lithium, lithium ion, uh, ten times more energy, energy dense than lead acid, but at the same price per kilowatt hour. To put that in layman's terms, if you were to put a Gnomes battery into my LG smartphone, uh, the battery could deliver two and a half times as much energy. Your charge would last not eight hours, but 24 hours without having to be, having to be recharged. Uh, again, to go back in history a little bit, you could uh, replace the battery, lead acid battery in my Nokia brick phone, and the battery would last the same amount of time, or would, it would last ten times as long, but for the same price. And so if we can move on to the next slide. Uh, these are our materials, the materials and components that we're developing for these higher energy uh, lower cost and safe lithium ion batteries. It's a combination cathode and electrolyte solution that, that um, when used together, they can increase battery life, uh, increase the charge rate, and uh, our electrolyte is non flammable, uh, high molecular weight material. And so that's, that's an advantage in itself. All of this IP comes from Cornell Technology. We have both materials and process patents in place. If we can go to the next slide. And this is just a quick view of our. Um, 
our goal, our vision for where we lie in the, in the value chain. So Gnome's Technologies is working with battery OEMs like uh, Lithion Corporation, um, uh, A123 Systems. We would work with those battery, those cell and battery pack manufacturers to put our materials into their battery systems. This is something that can be integrated into existing manufacturing. Uh, and then for any application, it doesn't have to be cell phones, but it could be vehicles, it could be grid storage. We see our key markets because of our materials um, uh, advantages as aircraft because we're very, very lightweight. We have a, a research and development uh, agreement in place now, both with NASA and with the Air Force. Uh, lead acid displacement, because our battery materials are very inexpensive, so we, we see ourselves doing very well in areas where lithium ion batteries are beginning to dis displace lead acid batteries as in, as in the forklift market. And then in utilities, uh, because our materials are very cheap, we can undercut lithium ion. We, we talked about in a previous presentation that lithium ion is too expensive for the grid, and that's not going to change in the next decade. Uh, lithium ion will still be too expensive. It's a materials problem. It's a systems problem. And, um, but we think that we can play there as well for UPS and backup storage. And time. Great job. Round of applause. Great job, Nathan. So, question from Zhang. Question from the panel. Uh, yes. Uh, hi, Nathan. Um, I, I think it's great you uh, get traction with uh, initial uh, military uh, customers. And uh, I guess I, I just have a question about sort of the whole. Um, uh, scale up, you know, in the manufacturing side. Uh, we know a lot of um, battery companies can make, you know, a few great samples, but can you really make, uh, you know, scale the product in a very consistent way? I'm just wondering if you or your team have experience in this area. Yes, so my, my background is uh, actually as a process engineer, um, and we have a lot of engineering experience on our team. But when these materials were designed, even back to the it's foundational days at Cornell. They were designed with scalable manufacturing in mind. So this isn't a process that needs clean room type atmosphere to be manufactured. This isn't a process that needs, um, you know, multiple layers of deposition coating. And it, it's a batch process. This is something we can put into a pot and mix up the ingredients. And with a very special chemistry and the right times and temperatures, we can make a very, very consistent product. Question from Anne. Can you briefly say why it's so much cheaper than uh, traditional lithium ion? Sure. Um, so we can take lithium iron phosphate as an example, but the, the layered materials are also have similar problems. Is that the, uh, it's a, nan a particle ba nanoparticle-based process, so uh, the controls for the nanoparticles, um, they have to be controlled to a very specific size and surface area and roughness, and, and then they have to be coated, and the coatings have to be uniform and then agglomerated. And so this is a multi-step process to make battery materials today. Um, we start with a... Uh, our, our composite material is a, is a two-step process rather than a eight-step process, six-step process. It depends on the other types of materials we're comparing with. But also our materials are very cheap. Sulfur and carbon are abundantly avail available. So. Question from Willem. So you just showed your uh, LG phone and, and what your battery can do. So why isn't there a GNOME's battery in your phone yet? We're working on it. <laughs> And, and so you mentioned that the uh, the sulfur is not a, a safety issue. Can you comment on that? Why sort of no sulfur can escape or, or how it can leak? Sure. That's um, so it's a safety issue because the anode that we're using, it's a very high energy material and, and there's always a uh, concern about shorting in, within the battery. Uh, we've overcome this because our high molecular weight electrolyte uh, has a, it's, um, it's very, very, it's, it can, um, it has a very high modulus, and again, in layman terms, that means it's very stiff, and so it resists that short. Uh, it's like a polymer electrolyte, but it's not. It has a much higher ionic conductivity than polymer electrolytes. It's a hybrid system. And a question from Yanni. Yeah, so you have the classic slide, look at all the things we do great. But usually, usually there's a trade-off, right? Mm -hmm. So you're trading off power for density or, retar or discharge or recycling. So what are you... What, is, what are the downsides or the, or the things that you're trading off in, in the case of your battery? Right. Um, I'd say that, uh, so our battery goes, so the number of cycles, uh, the number of times we can recharge the battery is one. There's some lithium-ion batteries that can recharge 5,000 or more times. Uh, our battery, we can recharge more than 500, which is still good enough for a cell phone, still good enough for many, many applications, but not good enough for every, every application. Uh, in um, recharge rate also, there are some lithium-ion batteries that can recharge in a minute. 
Ours takes an hour, half an hour. Um, still very good, but not for every application. We can play very widely, though. So. Great questions. Uh, we have time for one question from the audience. So would anyone in the audience like to um, ask a question? No? All right. Yes, sir. The question is, can the same structure be applicable in a supercapacitor? Uh, the active material is very different than it is in a supercapacitor, so no. no. Let's move into the feedback session. So, Yannick, let's start with you. What, what piece of uh, you know, feedback or productive advice would you like to give? Um, I, I like the space, and the technology sounds pretty interesting, actually. Um, uh, uh, the market is very challenging here, the one that you're targeting. Uh, first, I think you need something different for each of the markets you list as markets you're, ta cha you're, you're targeting. So that's a very different um, prospect for manufacturing, for development, et cetera, for testing. Um, and I, I also think because you're um, a component for very big elephants, let's call them the auto industry or the cell phone industry, um, it's, very tough to, it's a very tough go-to-market. Um, so I would just think about ways around that. But I think it's interesting. Yeah, yeah I think, you know, I think you have to, have to sort of focus a little bit on which, what's the key application because you just outlined some of the drawbacks of the technology and some of the strengths. So I think rather than being completely broad, make sure that you know where your advantages play to a strength in the application. And also think, you know, you mentioned you have two patents filed and then you're working with a lot of large partners. So I think, you know, to stay ahead of the large partners, I think it might be a challenge as well before, you know, you sort of get run over there. Yes, uh, exactly. I think it's an application problem. I, I think if you can only recharge about 500 times, that's probably not an auto market. And I don't know, about half an hour to an hour charging for a, a phone. But there must be ideal applications for this. And I think that's going to be the trick because it sounds like um, like a real breakthrough in other ways. Final feedback from John. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, same thing here. So um, identify the right uh, initial go-to-market par partner and customers are very critical here. And I was also trying to really um, think about sort of the business model here a little bit more. Are you, do you really want to touch the manufacturing piece or not? or whether you should be staying at really a technology company here. So that's a good question. Thank you. Great job. <laughs> Thanks, Nathan. Uh, so to vote for Nathan and Noam's Technologies, it's pound ultralight at N-O-H-M-S. And don't forget to vote for your panelists for their insightful advice as well. Uh, we're going to take a break in just a second, but... Before we do, we're going to hear from our sponsors here today. So, um, Willem, do you want to talk about Game Changer? Yeah, I just want to put a brief word out what Shell Game Changer does. So, um, we're, we're really like, like sort of the, the do tank for Shell rather than the think tank. So, we're really looking for innovative ideas, you know, in, the, in both in the clean energy space as well as using the, the existing conventional resources uh, better or more efficiently. Uh, we work with people. Uh, entrepreneurs, startup companies, inventors, people with ideas, novel business models, and, and we're looking for people with great ideas and also willing to execute them. We have a very, very flexible t uh, process to work with Shell. Uh, there's no fixed terms or conditions. It really depends on, on what, what the idea needs, where the synergy sits. So we really look for win-win partnerships and help develop the idea. And again, we are very, very flexible. So we both focus on our uh, future energy portfolio and also traditional oil and gas, chemicals, and downstream. So if you're interested, you can take a look at our website. And also, that's where we run our ideas portal. And that's where we collect uh, ideas that are uh, beneficial for Shell. And then we can help turn your idea into reality. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Will. Uh, Mike Shimazu of Nicerta. Thank you, Graham. And thank you, Graham and Chris, for putting this event on. It's uh, great to see this community come together. Uh, for all of you who came from outside New York, I'm from the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. A lot of people in New York know, know us for our uh, incentives for, uh, for energy efficiency measures and for solar and, uh, and other alternative energies. But we also uh, support uh, about $70 million worth of research and development in innovative energy technologies here in New York. And uh, it's great to see this community come together. I hope you all take advantage of our programs. And for those of you from outside, welcome to New York. Hope you stay. Awesome. Thanks so much, Mike. Appreciate it.
And lastly, we have our beloved Peter Rothberg from Reitler, Kalis, and Rosenblatt, longtime sponsor of ultralight startups. Um, I'm not sure if he knows more about energy than I do, but we will hear. <laughs> probably, probably not. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm Peter Rothberg. I'm a partner at Reitler, Kalis, and Rosenblatt. We are a 30-person law firm that specializes in representing startup companies, other tech companies, and venture funds. And uh, we, are, we, we believe ourselves to be a very strong part of the startup ecosystem here in New York City. I know I've got a couple of my colleagues here tonight. Please raise your hands. Tina, Lewis, and I thought I saw Matt before. Um, we're here every single Ultralight meeting. We are proud sponsors of uh, Ultralight. And let me tell you the kind of things that we can do for you. We can give you advice on startup issues for your companies, on operating issues for your companies. We can draft the necessary documents that allow you to finance your businesses and to operate your businesses going forward. We can connect you to our network of capital resources, which includes a lot of angel networks and uh, some of the, the 30 venture funds that we represent. And those venture funds are uh, invest everywhere from early stage through later stage uh, companies. We can provide budgets and capped fees, which we know is very important for startup companies as they um, plan for their legal needs, and we can really help you in that regard. Uh, we, we do this all the time, and we stand by our, our budgets. And we can give you senior-level advice at prices that you can afford. Uh, that's what we do. It's what we love to do. And uh, if you want to talk to any of us at the break, we'd be happy to talk to you. Uh, otherwise, we'll see you at the bar later on. Awesome. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, so I think this is the, uh, almost the last before we take the break. But uh, if when you are registering for this event on a site called Eventbrite, and you bought your ticket, you may have seen a question that said, do you want to be introduced to our preferred providers? And these are our preferred providers. So if you checked in any of those boxes, Peter Rothberg is our preferred legal provider. Jay Malone, right back here for web design and development. Mike Dietz of Datagram, I don't think is here today. Jack Petrie, Office Lease Center, is also not here today. And Beverly May of Oxford Technology is uh, our preferred provider for uh, interactive design. So friends of Ultralight, uh, SourcePad, uh, sometimes Joe Chin is here, but I don't see him here today. Seamless Web, or now, now known as Seamless, is the company that uh, sponsored the pizza. So thank them for that. So online food ordering system. And Mac Lipscomb. Right, Mac yeah. is all the way in the back there. Uh, Mac is the CEO coach and the pitch coach. He coached, I believe, seven of the eight teams that presented today in uh, sessions over Skype or face-to-face -face meetings. Um, we've gotten some fantastic feedback from him every single month. Uh, I know he also does uh, coaching sessions at General Assembly. Anything in particular you'd like to mention? Fantastic. All industries, all over the place, and uh, fantastic pitch coaching. Thank you so much, Mac. So we're going to take a, a five-minute break, and then we're going to come back for the remaining four pitches. Okay, folks, we're ready to start our next round of pitches. We've got four pitches lined up. And the next up is Aaron, Aaron. Blake. Aaron from Lawrenceville Power. Lawrenceville Plasma Physics. Can go to the next one? Yep. Lawrenceville Plasma Physics here. This is Fusion Power right here at Ultralight. Aaron, whenever you're ready. Good evening, everyone. My name is Aaron Blake. I'm the CFO from Lawrenceville Plasma Physics. And we are developing a fusion technology that is not only revolutionary but disruptive, too. We're developing a fusion power source, and as you know, fusion, nuclear fusion, is the power of the stars and the sun. And fusion is where you take two small atoms, and you squeeze them together really tight until they stick. And when they stick, it releases a lot of energy. This is how we do it in our lab. These are the electrodes within our device. A pulse of electricity goes between these electrodes, 
and heats up the, the plasma so high that it, com it makes the, uh, the fuel fuse. We will be using hydrogen and boron, which is aneutronic. It's a, another, uh, another word for it doesn't release neutrons. The, uh, the waste product is helium gas like in a balloon, a party balloon. So there's, it's safe. There's no chance of a meltdown. If everything goes wrong, it just stops working. Okay. Next slide. That's, oh, go ahead. There we go. This is what we envision our commercial product to be. It's a five megawatt generator that uh, costs about $500,000 to build, and it would run on a little bit of hydrogen and boron per year to the tune of about one-tenth of a cent per kilowatt hour production. Coal is about one cent per kilowatt hour, so it's about one-tenth the cost. Let's see. Uh, our generators will be... Uh, can you our generators will be safe, clean, and inexpensive. And unlike solar and wind, this will be uh, base load power, but it's also extremely variable. Just like your car engine is able to be revved up and down, we'd be able to do that also. Um, let's see. Our initial funding came in 1994 with a, from a grant from uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And since that time, in, in uh, 2003, we started looking for private investors, and we've gotten one, <coughs> one minute. One minute. We've gotten 1.2 million to start our company. We founded the laboratory, we built our device, and we are doing experiments now. Let's see, I need to hurry along here. So, in 2009 we built the lab, and now we've got, just last week we were front page in our local newspaper, we kind of hit the, uh, the internet news too, when we announced our 1.8 billion, de billion degree results, not million. And uh, that's, the, that's the world record for magnetically confined fusion. So people are starting to take notice of us, and uh, that's really exciting. So <laughs> 10 seconds. We're in the home stretch now. We're looking for $2 million to do our beta testing. And uh, so that's, that's our technology, how it's different than the competition, and how it will change the world. Thank you. Any, Any questions? Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Yannib, would you like to start with a question? Okay. Um, so this thing happened in Japan about a year ago. Um, that has made it very difficult for companies in the nuclear space to um, get permits, scale, develop, find financing. Um, how do you think about that? I know it's a different technology, um, but apart from that, it's the same ballpark, right? And remember, um, permitting and politics and financing are all rhetorical games. They're not necessarily about fact. It's the Washington guy speaking. Um, so, um, so I'm interested in how you think about that as a company going forward. People ask us that all the time, especially right, ac right after Fukushima. That was a big concern. We tried Speak right to get, into the mic. I'm sorry. We tried to get the EPA to come out and check us out, but they said, oh, we don't do that since you don't have any radioactive storage on site, and we wouldn't. Our, since our fuel would be hydrogen and boron, there, there is no radioactive fuels going in and there's no radioactive fuel, fuels going out. As far as uh, radiate, uh, neutrons flying out, uh, like I mentioned, it's aneutronic. It doesn't have the, the, uh, the, the neutrons going out to activate the walls of the reactor. Um, so we honestly don't have to worry about that. And again, the EPA doesn't even want to mess with this because we don't, we don't even fall into their protective category. Another question, uh, Will? So what's the, uh, the actual energy conversion, right? Because you can create the high temperature for the plasma and get to fusion. Then how do you sort of get net energy back? Okay, very good question. Traditionally, all other fusion approaches would produce that neutron that goes and hits the wall, makes the wall hot, makes steam, run steam through the turbine, and that's the approach. It's pretty ineffic inefficient. Even if you got a fusion reactor to work, that whole steam process would uh, lower the efficiency and make the cost much higher. What we do is, on this one here, we have this, uh, this coil here. Because it produces um, helium ions, they go shooting down because of the magnetic, magnetic field. They go shooting down through this coil, which is just like a, a regular transformer, essentially. Um, so it, it's a direct conversion of that ion beam into the flow of electricity. Hopefully that's... Not too complicated, but we also have this middle part, the, uh, the rings in the middle, to capture the x-rays. X-rays are the other byproduct, which no normally would be a killer for these other um, fusion reactors. 
you lose a lot of energy that way. But we have one of the, uh, one of the three innovations in our patent was for that piece right there that would transform the, uh, the high-energy X-rays into electricity using the regular photoelectric effect. So it's kind of like multiple layers of PV, essentially, for X-rays. And, and so you mentioned uh, the $500,000 for a 5 megawatt. So what is that $500,000 based on? That's based on the size of the equipment and uh, the capacitors. It's essentially, it would fit into a two-car garage, the whole setup. And this thing could be mass-produced on a, an automobile line, essentially. So scale, scaled up, it would be about 500,000. And the current prototype that gets that 1.8 billion degrees, um, you can't use that for fusion yet? Well, we are producing fusion. But right now, we are producing neutrons because we're testing it. We still have to, to, swap, to uh, change from deuterium, our test fuel, to the hydrogen boron. And that's why we need the $2 million. We need to upgrade our machine. We need to hire some uh, plasma physicists and, and uh, mechanical electrical engineers to make that conversion to that, that uh, fuel. Yes, John? Uh, yes, I have a couple of questions as well. Um, maybe the first question is, uh, have you done sort of the so the whole modeling, so you know, before experiments, so whole modeling. Like computer see, modeling? Yeah. So those are being totally sort of validated and it's possible to, you know, build a five megawatt sort of the scale. Uh, yes. That's the we, first we are question. doing some computer modeling. Okay. And uh, so second question is really around sort of, you know, this 1.8 billion degree, at what kind of materials can sustain that for that? high temperature, and the second is uh, how long that 1.8 billion degree lasts, you know, like okay. when you generate fusion. Uh, uh, again, that's a very good question. Yeah. This, this all happens at the, the fusion, that very, very hot spot is only a few microns across. Mm -hmm. It's not very big at all. And it only lasts for a few nanoseconds. It's a pulse device. Uh, we're, we're creating fusion, but it's not, it's not like other fusion reactors where it's, they try to maintain a stable plasma. Ours is like if you compare fusion with uh, breaking the sound barrier, instead of building a jet airplane to go faster than the spe speed of sound, we're like cracking a whip. We just do it momentarily using not much energy, and it only lasts for a small second, but then we capture that energy that, then is, that, that is then released in a pulsed way. Again, if it, there's no chance of it running away. If anything went wrong, the next pulse just wouldn't happen. So that's, it's, it's very different than most um, fusion approaches. Okay. Do I have time to ask one more question? Yes, quickly. Okay. Um, so from today, you know, uh, building a, a, a prototype to really a uh, scale, uh, what are the critical uh, sort of the milestones you have to meet to do that? I'm just wondering if you have you okay, know, some we do, through those. Yes. The, the qu very quickly, the, uh, the milestones, we have, our, we have three phases. One is demonstrating energy break even. That's just showing that we can produce the energy. Uh, phase two of our research and development will be building this energy capture equipment. And then phase three would be the commercialization of the whole package. So e each of these steps has multiple milestones, but they're all, they're all pretty laid out uh, on the website. If anybody wants to check it out, it's all, all the milestones are laid out. Yes, thank you. And would it be okay if we started with you from the comment section, from the comment round? Okay, sure. Uh, I'm not sure what your... Um what the competition is in this type of fusion reactor. Is there anyone else doing this rather than the tokamak? No questions. <laughs> okay, okay, as, a, answer that, I guess, quickly. But generally, with this feedback. particular device, there is no competition pursuing fusion energy right now. There are other, there's multiple companies and governments around the world who make, who, are, who work with this device, but not specifically for fusion energy. Okay. So, so I would just encourage you to keep up with it. I think it's very. Very intriguing. The idea of cheap, unlimited, safe, clean energy is mighty, <laughs> <laughs> Thank mighty <you>. compelling. <laughs> that, that fits well with my comment, actually. Um, key, like, red light for VC is when there seems like it's too good to be true. Um, so there's something you're either not telling us or we're missing. There's always something. There's always a risk. And I'm not a nuclear scientist. So as is obvious. So I'm trying to, try, so trying to figure out, but I, I, I'm sure there's something that we should kind of talk about, and, and you should maybe um, talk about whenever you pitch an investor, because it's something that we like to hear, and we like to hear how you think about it. 
Um, and the last thing is I'd hire a phenomenal marketing team if this is going to take off. Yeah, yeah I think in my, in my mind it's the, it's the sort of, you know, the whole controversy around uh, fusion itself. So I wouldn't focus necessarily so much on the science, but convince people you've got a reasonable timeline to deliver something, right, to make it attractive for an investment. Because otherwise, if you're still seen as a sort of a science experiment, then you sort of you look more to the government for funding there rather than, you know, to private investors and, and really be attractive, right? So getting, getting over that first hurdle and, and show you got a, a reasonable timeline to produce, you know, the $500,000 device. And John? Uh, yes. Um, I, by the way, it was great advice. Um, we actually have a, a fusion investment uh, already. Yes. Yeah, so we sort of understand the space. So, so we are a strong believer. This is a you know, great, great uh, space. So we will be very interested in talking to you further. Uh, like, uh, so um, I, I think my, um, I guess I'd like to understand more before giving you any advice. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Get your checkbook out, sounds like. <laughs> well done. Great job, Aaron. So if you'd like to vote for Aaron at um, Lawrenceville Plasma Physics, make sure you're sending a tweet to pound ultralight and including the at LPPX handle. Make sure okay. you vote for the panel as well. Awesome. Uh, Gary Henderson is up next. And then we have Jim Knight from Pellet Co. Should be making his way over here on deck. All right. Three minutes. Uh, uh, good evening. Thanks for coming out. My name is Gary Henderson. I represent Gravitational Systems Engineering. We're looking for seed capital. Our products are all momentum-based or from this perspective, our products are based upon a new view of energy. That new view of energy is that energy is difference. Energy is change. There are a number of different venues. My best idea for describing what we do and what we offer is we are trying to be the automatic, wrist, uh, automatic winding wristwatch a, a device that provides adequate power for a specific need. Uh, what that means is that, uh, and I didn't realize I was going to be nervous up here. I used to, I used to teach here at NYU. Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, just take a look at some of the different ways in which uh, we approach it. Our primary device, and we're the speed bump people, is to provide something that would be built into the roadway. Uh, what it does is takes pressure, the moving pressure from uh, uh, as a car goes over it or other vehicle, uh, and converts that into some other useful form. The useful forms are fluid motion or gas compression. The uh, thing is, is that it, we don't realize it, but a average car is generating or dissipating 15 watts of energy into the roadway every quarter turn of the wheel. A truck up to 200 watts of energy per quarter turn of a wheel. Now, the question then becomes when you look at a technology like this, you say, well, the big issue is who wants to have more speed bumps? Or who wants to, uh, who, who wants to uh, think in terms of uh, putting things in the road that are going to potentially slow uh, people down? But that's not the case with this. As you'll see in this first image here, Although it appears like a speed bump, they're all painted green, and what happens is when you drive over it, it basically flattens out completely. What it does is it generates energy. That energy, uh, as I said, comes in either compressed air or as um, uh, fluid uh, motion. Now, we've been, I'm one of the inventors of this technology. We've been trying to market it for a few years, and it's been an uphill fight, to say the least. People are very skeptical. They're thinking, uh, well, this is, you know, something that's going to be uh, difficult to implement or difficult to have the public accept. Ten seconds. As a result, we are taking an applications approach. If you go to the second screen, our, sec uh, our applications approach is to provide, if you look down here at the bottom. Excuse and time. Oh. <laughs> Great job. 
Never enough time. Yes, yeah. What, and what is your applications approach? <laughs> and that is, is the two that are listed there. One is drought mitigation. Now, drought mitigation is an application that doesn't exist today. People don't even think about that. But the fact is, is that with the power that could be harvested from moving traffic, if you take, we're working on a project, or early stages on a project in Jordan now, wherein they have roads filled with, you know, crazy drivers that are driving fast, that are uh, going up and down, and extremely aired conditions. Our devices, in combination with that traffic flow, could, in fact, do uh, solve uh, drought in a couple of ways. The primary way is to just uh, move salt water from either underground sources or from the Red Sea and to distribute um, that water into the environment in a couple of different ways. The primary one is atmospheric water generators, which is a, a standard technology, one that's uh, uh, you know, been established for a long time. Uh, that with the scale and the power, the dense power that comes from these t uh, this type of device, uh, it becomes possible. That is to say, the dense energy that we provide makes applications that are generally considered to be impossible possible, and that includes drought mitigation, uh, and, and therefore to monetize uh, climate change to some extent, uh, and air pollution control, uh, and a couple of others. So how do you pay for, how do you account for transmission of the water or the energy? What are the costs associated with that um, that are, will, will factor into whether your application is something that people would roll out? I don't know if I understand the question. The fact is... So, so you're creating energy or compressed air or you're pumping water, whatever, whichever application it is uh -huh. that the speed bump is producing, uh -huh. right? That has to go somewhere, right? Okay. It has to be transported, and there's okay. infrastructure and costs and loss of energy associated with transporting it, right? Okay. What, how do you think about those? Things? Well, that's why I say that the self-winding watch is my best example. What we want to do is to use it for applications wherein the energy can be used immediately. Roadway de-icing, uh, things that have variety, using you know some combination of conductive uh, concrete uh, plus some, ex some uh, different ways that we've... Um, been able to engineer, but primarily we want to use in the energy locally. And one of the primary applications we're targeting is toll booths, and that is to say toll booths not only need energy, but also have something else, uh, another need that we can provide, and that is in enhanced safety, because it can, even though it's generally going to operate strictly to generate energy, if it's configured correctly, it also can provide an exponential decay function. And that exponential decay function means that it can slow down targeted traffic, but be uh, uh, almost 100% transparent to, tar uh, to traffic that's not targeted. So you get a truck that's moving too fast, it'll actually be stopped, but cars will be unaffected. Okay. So do you actually have a, a working prototype? Yes, we do. And so what are you looking at for sort of dollars per kilowatt for installed well, uh, once again, it's going to be according to the application. If we do have to transmit the energy any great distances, that can, uh, th that's probably the biggest issue. But done at a, um, uh, done at a toll booth or done for roadway de-icing, uh, you eliminate your fuel costs completely. The only cost question is going to be maintenance and reliability. Uh, but these are all manufactured out of recycled rubber. Uh, they're, uh, right now, we're selling the product for $1,000 a unit, but it's easily something that can be manufactured uh, in any number of third world countries, and we can probably bring the unit cost down to a couple hundred dollars a unit. We're going to ask uh, two more questions, a question from Ann and a question from John. And, and Gary, just a few words from a response perspective. We're, we're short on time. Okay, sorry. I just, I just think that the energy harvesting issues are really s strong problems here. So maybe your idea of using it very locally for a toll booth, say, would work. But it's just, it's hard to see how you could economically gather the energy generated by this. Although the, the idea of it is clever, it's just implementing it. I think sounds very difficult. Well, because we don't try to convert to electricity. We're using the power immediately. That is to say, compressed air can be used for air conditioning. It can be used for you know, sign control. 
uh, and also too in uh, using something like a Sterling engine or a company that we're working with out of Australia, it can be used to generate short-term power. But this also makes it ideal for factories that use a lot of compressed air directly. Let, let's move into okay. the, the feedback session now. So maybe, Jung, if you could just uh, give some yeah. advice to Gary in, in terms of uh, you know, uh, take home, take home. All right, I, I guess this one's hard for me to sort of, uh, you know, get excited, you know, just listening to your pitch. Uh, this is very candid feedback here. Um, so I guess, uh, so my, I guess my questions, you know, you sort of having a, a very, so you know, very good idea, but how do you really, you know, sort of which market you go far first, and uh, you know, what is sort of the payback? So you haven't really quantified everything, the benefit. So that would be my advice to really go back to quantify those opportunities. Thank you. Yeah. Feedback from Anne. I don't think I have anything to add to that. That was good advice. Well, well. I think there's no such thing as free energy, right? So like even if a car is driving over it, you're sort of penalizing the driver for probably increased fuel efficiency or using more fuel, right? So I think it's really looking for this embodiment where sort of mass coming to a stop always occurs, right? So maybe the toll booth actually is, might be one of your better applications because everyone has to break that, right? Unless you've got sort of an easy tack line. But even there, you know, sort of people will notice it, right? So your competing technology is really, I think, regenerative braking because that's sort of the alternative, right? If it's built in the vehicle, so it's almost easier to put it in the vehicle rather than on the road. Right. So I think it's really looking at the right embodiment to find the niche, and then it's sort of the, the, the quantitative assessment of what, how much energy you get out at what cost. Recommendation, Yanni. Yeah, uh, infrastructure plays are difficult traditionally for two reasons. One is cost, um, which I think if you pick a particular application and focus on that, then you can iron out all the things that Zhang was talking about and really get, give us a sense of the cost of everything, which I think could be problematic or not. We don't know. Um, and the other is because there are a lot of interested parties that are involved. And so you really need to think about how, if you're talking about a road, you've got states, municipalities, drivers, except there's a million people who care about what happens there. Um, and they have to all be on the same page. So I think you need to think about when you pick that application from the first part of my comment, what, how do all of those parties, what is the pitch to them and why do they want to do it? Great job. Thank you, Gary. Okay, make sure, make sure you're voting. Make sure you're voting on Twitter for, um, for Gary at Gravitational Systems Engineering, and it's at GSC Inc. I and mean, you're including Pound Ultralight in your tweet, and you're voting for your panel as well. Fantastic. Thanks, Chris. Next up, Jim Knight of Pellet Co. Thanks. I'm probably the only other person in the room that knows where they uh, floated the balloon earlier. Way up in northern Maine. We're located in Orono, Maine. My name is Jim Knight, and uh, I am a serial entrepreneur. I've, uh, my last uh, venture, we raised a million dollars, built a $120 million company, and the investors exited within three years at four times. Tonight, I'm looking for a million dollars worth of equity. Uh, we're a spin-off of the University of Maine, and in fact, we're closing our first uh, preliminary round next Monday for $300,000 into convertible debt. What we make is a high-performance solid biomass fuel. And we use it for thermal energy for commercial customers only, not residential. So we're sort of like the high-test fuel option when you get down to the uh, gas station. We combine biomass with our patented binder and that helps us to achieve 11,000 BTUs per pound, as opposed to wood at 8,000. So a 40% uptick in the energy value on equivalent weight basis. We can use either wood or any kind of agricultural residue as the uh, biomass component. Our composite binder comes from recycled plastics. And we sell it as either fuel or as heat. And we are based purely on market economics. In terms of the opportunity size, it's huge. Uh, we, um, we compete against oil and propane, so we go where natural gas isn't. Oil and propane for thermal energy is now $40 per MMBTU. We can produce the equivalent energy at $10 per MMBTU. There's $5 billion spent in the Northeast every year alone on thermal energy in the commercial and institutional space. 
Our first customer is the University of Maine, and we are uh, re there. We're replacing 15,000 gallons of fuel oil per year. And uh, our plan going forward is uh, heat sales and pellet sales. It, by way of summary, pure market economics, no subsidies. We're the high-test fuel, and you can find out more about us at pelletco.com. Thank you. Great job. Good timing. So now, a round of questions. We're going to keep it nice and tight. So, um, Jung, if you'd like to start. Um, great, yes. I, I had a privilege actually asking some questions before. Um, so I guess we continue that um, question I asked you. Uh, you said there's no real actually manufacturing facility. You are outsourcing the manufacturing. So you're, uh, you know, your you're key business is really in the logistics and the uh, channel of sales, and just can you talk a little bit about your business model? Maybe yeah, that's our, right. our primary business model is creating demand. And so we want to benefit uh, from that by the licensing revenue. And with the producers, what we're doing is we're starting off by crawling, having them produce a little bit. We pay them rent for their factories uh, in order to produce a few hundred tons. Then we walk. I take in a 10,000 uh, ton order. They, their economics get better. They cut me a better price. And then we run with them where it creates a new product line for them, and they provide us with a royalty. Question, Ann? Yeah, you mentioned earlier um, when I was speaking with you that you provide leasing or, or sell boilers to consumers so they can um, use this fuel, and that those are expensive pieces of equipment. Can you say how much and how you would finance them? Yes, uh, and thank you. That's an important question because it is a capital soak in a good and a bad way. In a good way in the sense that the capital required roughly is $10 per gallon of oil replaced. So if I take the 15,000 gallons of oil that we're replacing at the University of Maine, that creates capital need of 150000 We're budgeting uh, uh, $1.5 million in the next 12 months for heat sales opportunities. So we'll be replacing 150,000 gallons of oil, of fuel oil. So you expect to buy most of this equipment and, and lease it to customers? W what we'll do is we'll buy it, we containerize it along with the fuel storage inventory, we put it right next to their building, and we pipe in and meter the amount of heat uh, in the form of hot water that we're delivering to them, and then we send them a bill. So it's similar to being the local, local utility your backyard utility, if you will. Question, well, and by the way, the payback on that is under three years. So how sensitive is the process to the moisture content of the biomass you're, you're putting in the pallets with the, uh, the binder? Uh, and that's a, that's a very interesting question because biomass in wood chip form is 40 to 70 percent moisture. Once you go to pellets, it comes down below 10. Uh, and the, it is sensitive to it, but that's controlled in the manufacturing process. And actually, the benefit that we provide is a low moisture fuel. So in essence, it's like putting uh, s solid natural gas into a boiler. But so, yeah, so, for, so you're, you're bolting on to existing pellet mills and, and, and those types of facilities? Yes, we're able to piggyback right on the existing pellet mills with uh, virtually no additional capital expenditure. It's very easy to add another... Uh, another additive into the mix. Yeah, so I, I think of the critique that people make of corn ethanol about how it requires more energy to produce less energy. Um, so how, I, I'm wondering if you've done this analysis for this. So when you account for the energy that's required for the materials to go to the producer, for them to produce the pellet and for the pellet to be brought to wherever it's being used, and, and then, of course, the loss of energy from burning it or whatnot, how much energy is expent versus how much energy you're creating? The, and, and that's also a great question because when, when you talk about wood, you talk about the largest energy sink is in having to reduce the moisture out of the wood, eliminate the moisture at the molecular level, and that's coming out of the wood chips. Uh, now, we have the ability to use not just wood but also agricultural residue where the moisture is ambient moisture, more down at the 15 as opposed to the 40% level. And so that makes it substantially more economically feasible. So, so Yanni, yeah, actually starting with you, can we jump right into the feedback from you? Sure. Uh, my feedback is I'm not sure that answers the question or alleviates the problem. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. 
Um, I'd, I'd be a bit concerned about the, the regulatory, again, the regulatory environment around using recycled plastics and the byproducts of burning that, sort of how do you sort of quality control the binder. And then because the big drive is to use biopellets for biofuel, it sort of reduce the carbon footprint, right? And if you start blowing off any potential toxins or whatever goes with it, right? So how do you control that? I think that would be a key to understand that and whether or not you know, you sort of be attractive to you know, even larger scale, right, for, for coal firing in a coal fired plant, and do you really offer savings for with a consistent product there? Yeah, I think that the large market is in, in Europe for pellets, and so how you address that market, which likes wood rather than composite, is an issue. Um, and so maybe you get started here with the composite, but maybe there's another model, too, to move into. I think the market is really uh, sort of uh, uh, seasonal and also localized in U.S. Probably, you know, I think uh, um, so. It's sort of I'm not sure how you really uh, scale the business in U.S. So that's my first question, uh, comments, and the second one I I would say um, uh, the BTU is BTU. So you're competing with other sort of uh, use for this feedstock that you're having. So there's other maybe there's other sort of uh, applications can better use your feedstock, and so I'm just I guess I'm not not convinced this is sort of a great value proposition. Great job. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. And uh, to vote for Pellet Co. as the best pitch, it's send a tweet with pound ultralight and at Pellet Co. Uh, our last pitch. Okay. John Green from Widetronics. Um, whenever you're ready, John. It was great it. to see another nuclear technology in the mix. So I don't often see that. So at Widetronics, we're making very tiny, extremely long-lived batteries for defense and medical applications. The core technology is called beta voltaics. You see on the upper right there. What we do that's really unique is we embed a very thin layer of radioactive material onto a proprietary semiconductor that was originally developed at Cornell University. And what happens is as that radioactive layer decays, it sends electrons to the semiconductor. So much in the same way a solar cell works, we collect those electrons and they produce a constant current and voltage over the lifetime decay of that semiconductor. This is technology that's over 50 years old and the uh, innovation is really in the development of the semiconductor and the, the integration with the layer. So, the, the question is, what do you do with the technology that produces nanowatts to microwatts? Well, our market entry strategy is really focused on two key market drivers. On the defense sector, we're focused on the long lifetime, 25 years of this technology, and we're currently working with prime contractors on the development of what are called anti-tamper sensors. These are sensors that don't need a lot of power, but they need it for a very long time, and traditional battery technology cannot deliver that kind of value. Um, it's not a huge market by venture capital standards, but it's completely unmet market need, and uh, it's, it's uh, mandated by the Department of Defense, and we're actually funded by several agencies to provide this technology to them. And you can see one of the prototypes here that we're working with uh, a prime contractor on. The second area of focus is in medical implants, and here the driver is small size, millimeter size power sources. And we're working with a $12 billion medical implant company on a very tiny battery for a sensor that's about the size of your pinky now. So you can imagine the size of what we have, the real estate that we have available. And here, it's, it's a relatively nascent market for physiological sensors. We're specifically working on a cardiac pressure sensor. And, uh, and this is kind of a sense for what you're looking at. Um, this is a, a very large market potential long term. And uh, it's multiple sectors, both in physiological monitoring and therapeutics. Next slide, please. So uh, the team's been working together for about five years now. We're seven employees strong, very lean, focused on, on engineering itself. The product, again, the innovation is in the semiconductor originally developed at Cornell University. We are anticipating sales uh, on our initial demo boards in 2012 this year with uh, growth in actual revenue in 2013 specifically centered around the defense uh, application. And what I didn't mention from the previous slide is there are two iterations of our products. We're building both a sensor platform 
as well as a ver just a bare dye um, out of the semiconductors. So there's really two kind of product lines we're working on simultaneously. Uh, we're actually venture funded. We, we closed the seed round. We've got strategic investment as well as uh, contracts from the Department of Defense, and we're looking to raise $10 million this year uh, to scale up and uh, migrate to uh, an actual foundry. Anytime. Thank Good you. Job. Well done, John. So let's take some questions from the panel. Um, Yannick, would you like to start? Uh, I need a second. Okay. Um, so as you mentioned, the, uh, the, the power is driven by a decaying radioactive material. So does that mean that you get initial lifetime of the battery, you get a peak power, and then it decays? Or how do you deal with that, that difference in power level? What we do is we, we, we define, we, we figure out what the end of life is, and we scale to that application. So it's just whatever, you know, well, radioactive decay is well known. So if you need a microwatt at the end of 25 years, then you, we use tritium. So there's a 12-year uh, half-life, so we scale up to whatever it needs to be. But so then you, you have to sort of, you're wasting power in the initial life cycle of the battery. You have more at the beginning of your life cycle and, and what you need at the end of your life cycle. I think traditionally these batteries have been very expensive, which may be why the medical route works. But do you have to lower the price of these, or are they already at a level that is acceptable? Yeah, the again, again, the innovation is really around the semiconductor. One of the reasons why they've been so expensive is because of the conversion efficiency. And traditionally, this was actually used in pacemaker batteries in the 70s, and they use silicon. The conversion efficiency is, is really low. Uh, we use silicon carbide, which is one of the highest conversion efficiencies. And so that's what really drives. And we've actually done cost comparisons today with float zone silicon, which is kind of the premium silicon. And we actually, with silicon carbide, which is on a wafer per wafer basis more expensive, um, it's, it's actually, it, it, it competes very directly with silicon. So none of your development at this point involves trying to lower the cost. You're just trying to prove the product at this point, or where are you in the development side? Uh, so uh, we're currently doing kind of what I would call batch runs on the semiconductor and, batch run and the integration of the isotope. The work we need to do on the isotope integration is actually taking uh, a standard commercial process that our partner uses and customizing it for us. But it's, they already do this for other products. All we're doing is basically taking what they do and, and changing the delivery of the isotope to it. It's a very simple conversion process. And our last question from John. Okay. Um, so you mentioned this is semiconductor innovation, but silicon carbide is really not a standard semiconductor it is process? Now. It is now. Uh, what, can you just give an example of like what kind of foundries or uh, processes you, you know, you, I, I'm sure you're not doing in-house, right? You're probably having a yeah, we make, we, we make, model, right? We fab at the Cornell Nanofab right now with, with silicon carbide, and we have several different partners that we can work with. We, we, we know the folks at Cree really well. The founders of this company kind of grew up in the, semi, the wide band gas semiconductor field, so there's a lot of kind of core knowledge and, 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 and connections in that regard. Okay. So, 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 so leveraging sort of the 3.5 sort of the foundries, not traditional silicon, right? That's what they... Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's an interesting question, but th there are there are lots of not, I wouldn't say a lot of places you can you can uh, foundry silicon carbide, but there are enough places both domestically and overseas, and we know all those places. So. Okay, I guess the question is similar to uh, this is really the cost, right? If you uh, silicon carbide is quite expensive, so so do you have sort of the cost curve really to help you to really be competitive? You know. Yeah, so for the applications that we're targeting, um, we're, not, we're not competing directly against uh, like a, a $1 lithium battery. So we're looking at, again, long-lived applications, 25 years, and space-constrained applications where a traditional lithium battery can't compete. So we're not, we don't have to compete directly with that cost per se. But as I said, um, our, our, our costs are well-known. Costs of silicon carbide are well-known. We model all those. And we and once you get and just to give you an example, um, a ten thousand dollar single wafer that we purchased today, if we produce it uh, in volumes, is about a tenth of the cost of that. Uh, so you can actually quickly get to float zone silicon, which would be kind of the equivalent semiconductor if you were to go to that. Yeah, Nick, would you like to close out? Uh, yeah, I didn't have a question, so I'll just start the comment phase or whatever. Um, my questions were around cost, which were addressed. Um, 
Uh, there's two things. Well, what your market for defense is admittedly small, which you self-admitted, and the medical market is also small from what you admitted, but is also really, really difficult. Um, so it's a very long life. It requires a lot of capital to get through all of the hurdles in the medical space, and the FDA is really not friendly right now. Um, so I would think of what strategy is, is on the medical side helps buffer that, both from a capital perspective and a risk of approval perspective. Um, and the only, only other thing I'll say is I would think creatively when you're pitching for a Series A that you're raising of a way to turn all of the M's on the market size into B's um, because VCs are really looking for billion-dollar market opportunities or larger. So um, I would think about making it into more of a platform to make it even more compelling and let us reduce the numbers, not, not you. Yeah, um, I, I would see if there's any way to sort of go, go beyond the nanowatt or microwatt because, you know, if you read what you submitted, I think you provided much more information than you pitched sort of go in these wireless networks. And I can see from an industry sort of sensing monitor perspective, if you can get there, I think, I think there's a market that might be much bigger. I'm not sure whether it's the Bs than the Ms. But, but I think you need more power, right, for most applications. I think that's the key, whether maybe you've put them in parallel or sort of in series and then bring the cost down enough. You know, you can, you can build it more in a, in a platform for surveillance and monitoring, which I think, you know, we always like more data in any facility we run, right? Feedback again. Yeah, very good advice. And I notice you have some very deep-pocketed funders already. So uh, maybe you would want to keep funding with them until you prove out a larger size device. Final advice from John. Um, I don't have further, you know, in more insight. But I, I think the interesting opportunity you should uh, pursue and, uh, you know, see if you can really find uh, applications for. Fantastic job. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. Do we have our... Uh... <laughs> okay. I just, okay. Uh, before, I, before I forget, I forgot to mention that Richard Smith is in the audience as well, so he's with Shell as well, if anyone wants to touch base with us. Okay. Well, sounds like it brings us to the pitch. That's right. That is right. So we are going to be announcing our winners momentarily. In the meantime... I will make a couple of announcements. Uh, so this is a good time to vote. If you haven't voted for your favorite startup, uh, Palm Ultralite, and at their Twitter handle. Also, if you haven't voted for your favorite panelist, now is a great time to do that. Palm Ultralite and their Twitter handle. So we will be awarding those momentarily. Announcements. We are doing Future Energy Boston in about a month. Uh, Wednesday, um, that's a Monday actually, Monday, May 14th, there is no Wednesday, May 14th this year, Monday, May 14th, um, hosted by right here, Chris DeLuca in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, applications for this are open, so if you uh, want to pitch at Future Energy Boston, you can go to ultralightstartups.com and find the application there. Uh, applications close next Friday. So get those applications in soon and we will review them. Uh, there is an investor feedback forum. So our standard internet startup event is going to take place uh, Thursday, May 10th, uh, right here in New York City. And that's up at Microsoft. So for all of those of you that have been to our regular ultralight events, um, that's where you'll go. Contest winners, we have prizes just to review. A free application to Cleantech Open Northeast, uh, free presentation at Agrion, free presentation to New York Angels, automatic bid to present there, media training worldwide, media training, and $500 in Amazon Web Services credit. Um, and afterwards, immediately after this contest and we announce the winners, we're going to go to Murphy and Gonzalez, which is two blocks away. If you walk out the front door, You'll be in a large plaza-like area, and you face the street, and you go two blocks straight. And there you'll see Murphy and Gonzalez, which is where I'll be, and Chris will be there, and many of our esteemed panelists and presenters will be there, too. Follow the crowd. Follow the crowd. That's right. And don't stay in here too long. That's the, that's the critical thing. People stick around here in this room, and they chat, and it's great, but that all should happen at Murphy and Gonzalez and not here. <laughs> we need to get up, rid of this room and... and, and um, be gracious to our hosts here at NYU. You ready? 
We're, we're done. We are done. So. Okay. Okay. I guess, and the, the panel. Oh, I see. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So here we have it. You ready? Wow, this is exciting. So come Drum on roll. down when I announce your name. Third best pitch tonight, by your choice, the nuclear fusion Lawrenceville plasma physics. After that round, nuclear fusion here at Ultra Lead Startups. <laughs> Number two is Gnomes. Nathan Ball, Nathan Ball from Gnomes, well done. Number one, best pitch by your choice, Alteros Energies, Inc. <laughs> All these guys win. And the number one, the really the, the plum prize of the whole contest, <laughs> right here. One of these four people, and it's Yeni Suisa from NEA. <laughs> Congratulations. Okay. So don't forget Murphy and Gonzalez right now, and don't stick around in this room for too long. Thank you very much.